so today I want to talk about um, low rank matrix completion over GF2. Um, and so, uh, you know, so I should probably have a little bit of preamble. So I got, you know, I learned about, I guess, entropic vectors and stuff like that maybe 10, 11 years ago. And so I got very excited originally. You know, it's a very elegant framework, seems like a very fundamental question, not seems, I guess is a very fundamental question. Um, and then I quickly realized it's a tough problem, right? And, you know, um, not a whole lot that we've been able to do. And so the way I think of this talk is, you know, here's the problem we really want to solve. And here's a problem we can solve, or maybe can try to solve. And so let's solve what we can solve. And then let's BS and say there's a connection between um, these two. So I will spare you the BS. Maybe I'll say a little bit about it at the beginning. Um, but I think this other problem that we're solving is of interest in its own right and does have some bearing with, with um, the more general topic of, of this workshop. Um, so this is joint work with James Saunderson, um, currently a postdoc with me. He'll be joining Monash University in Melbourne um, in May and Mariam Fazel, who's at the University of uh, Washington, Seattle. Okay, so here's the outline. Um, I'll start off with a bit of an introduction, basically um, showing that problems like linear network coding, linear index coding, and a set of other problems can be related to low rank matrix completion um, over some finite field. Um, so basically the problem is you have some matrix, certain entries are given, certain entries are indeterminates, and you want to fill the indeterminate entries um, so as to minimize the rank. Okay? And what distinguishes this from problems that have been fairly well studied, and I'll talk about them a little bit later, which is matrix completion over reals, is that you know, here we have a finite field. <coughs> now. Um, when you have reals, there's a whole host of algorithms that people have come up with. They're usually based on convex relaxations, so they're efficient. Um, but more importantly, they have provable guarantees. Um, so they don't solve every instance of, say, matrix completion. But you can give conditions under which they are guaranteed to work. And so we're kind of looking for a counterpart of that in the finite field case. And so um, kind of in order to get there, I'll mention something about a, a problem going back to Feldman's uh, MIT PhD thesis in 2003, which is, at least for me, the only instance of a problem, a, a truly finite field problem that's solved through a surrogate, through um, convex relaxation. So I'll talk something about Feldman's linear programming decoding. And we'll use the second and third bullets here, I guess, <laughs> as uh, motivation for the work I want to talk about. So I'll, I'll essentially try to describe, um, well, two algorithms, I would say, um, for matrix completion over finite fields. One which is not really practical, but for which we can give guarantees. The second one which is practical and which works very well, but for which we currently don't have any proof. But that's also, I think, because this is very recent result. Uh, or recent results. So I'll, I'll give you some simulations and I'll kind of conclude. Um, <clears throat> so in order to set the stage, let me go through a very simple network, linear network coding problem. Again, this is not full generality and you know I've done it sloppily, but the objective is not really linear network coding. It's just to motivate um, why we're studying um, uh, matrix completion. So we're going to look at, essentially, I think it's better if I use this. So we're going to have an acyclic network. There's a set of sources, script S. So there's M sources, S1 through SM. Then there's the set of edges in the network, E1 through EN, so N edges, if you will. And then a set of destinations. There's P of them. And uh, the way we're setting things up, Without loss of generality, you can assume that each destination, say the ith destination di, requires a particular source. And so it requires a source s of f di. f of di is an index, which, or index function, essentially telling us, you know, that source di wants, excuse me, destination di wants um, the source index by f di. Okay? And so this is general. I mean, a more general setting would be one where a source may want uh, excuse me, a destination may want multiple sources, 
But you know, um, you can always make copies of a particular destination if there's multiple sources and have each of them uh, want one of the sources. So this is fairly general. Um, I'm going to assume, because we're doing linear network coding, that all the signals, whether they're sources or whether they're signals going on the edges, belong to some finite field, say GFQ. And the way the topology of the network is going to come in, as you all know, is, is in the following fashion. So uh, let's suppose I'm sitting somewhere in the network and I have um, the edge EI down here. Now there's two sets of um, if you will, edges or sources that, that connect to EI. So there's a set, say, S in of I. So I refers to the ith edge. So it's either the set of sources incoming to EI. It's a subset of the all, all the sources. And we have another set, um, which is a subset of all the edges, which are the edges incoming to edge I. Okay? And so basically, um, what the topology of the network essentially says is that if you want to construct the signal EI, it's some linear combination of the sources coming into it and the edges coming into it. And I'm indicating these by alphas and betas. Okay, um, okay so this is imposing, if you will, the topology of the network, that EI has to be constructed in this fashion. Alphas and betas, of course, as you know, these are what are called the uh, local coding coefficients. Um, and so similarly, if you look at a particular destination, again, uh, there might be a set of sources connected to the destination and again a set of edges. Um, and so basically the requirement is that the particular source that destination DK wants has to be reconstructed by linear combinations of the sources which it's connected to that are input to that uh, particular destination and the edge um, signals as well. Okay? Again, alphas and betas are, if you will, uh, local coding coefficients that make this thing possible. So all the alphas and betas I showed you are these local coding coefficients. Okay? So we have essentially a bunch of linear equations. And you know, here I'm just pictorially showing you what that means. And so in this particular setting, um, because what we have so we have n equations, one for each of the n edges. And then we have p equations, one for each of the um, destinations or the demands, if you will. So this matrix will have n plus p rows. Um, and it'll have, I guess, m plus, p, m plus n excuse me, columns because there's m sources and n edges and everything was a linear combination of these two. Okay? So if you look at, for example, the first uh, n equations. These are the equations for the edges. So the first equation is saying edge 1 is say a function of source 1 and source 2. It's a linear combination of those two. I don't know, edge 2 is a linear combination of edge 1, I guess source 2, source m, and so on. Um, and if you look at say the next set of equations here, so the, the p equations down here, the first equation essentially is saying that source 1 which I guess is desired from the first destination, has to be recovered from, I don't know, edge 1 and edge n and so on, okay? Um, and so you get this matrix which has this 0, 1 indeterminate pattern, right? So the 1s are coming from the fact that each of the source, uh, each of the edges and destinations had to be recovered in a certain way. 0 shows up because those are the edges and sources that do not participate in an equation, and the x's, the indeterminates, are really the alphas and betas that we had on the previous slide. Okay? So this is the matrix we have. As I said, this matrix consists of zero ones and don't cares, and the don't cares are where the local coding coefficients sit. And so let's say what we want to do in, in our network is to maximize the sum rate. So we want to satisfy, you know, or to get as many messages as possible across. And so how could you do this? It turns out, and I'm going to gloss over details because that's not the main focus of this talk, that if you want to maximize the sum rate, you should choose the don't care entries so to maximize the dimension of the right null space of A. Okay? So <coughs> sources and edge variables that satisfy this equation, of course, are in the null space of this matrix. 
And so the larger the dimension of this null space, in some sense, the more messages we can pack. Um, and so that's what that statement is saying. Again, I've glossed over some details in saying that. Um, and equivalently, if we want to maximize the sum rate, we should choose or to complete the matrix in such a way so that it has a minimum rank. Because when you minimize the rank, it'll maximize the dimension of the null space. And in particular, if the rank is R, then the sum rate is M plus N minus R. Because, um, if you will, the dimension of the column vectors multiplying A is M plus N. And so if the rank is R, that will give you the dimension of the null space, which is the sum rate. Okay, so we want to minimize um, the rank. And so let me just show you a this classical butterfly example, just so you see how this comes about. Um, so we have two sources. Again, they're A and B, not S1 and S2, because I was just searching on Google images of butterfly network, and I couldn't find one with S1, S2. So, so I found one with A and B. So S1 is A, S2 is B. The edge here we have the solution already, we know it's going to be A plus B, but let's call this thing E. Okay, so the edge between 3 and 4 is E. So everything else is either a source or this particular edge. Um, so there's two sources, one edge. And so this particular edge, you know, what you put on it is a linear combination of the two sources. So those are the alpha, say E1, meaning from source 1 to the edge, from source 2 to the edge. If you look here at node U, Node U wants to recover, say, both signals S1 and S2. It's a destination. It already has S2 because it has B, so it should be able to recover S1 through a linear combination of its two incoming things, one of which is the edge variable, the other one which is S2 itself. And so that's that equation. There's a similar equation for this node here. And so if you write that out, that's the matrix A that you want. Okay? And so we need to complete this to minimize the rank. Turns out there's a rank one uh, completion of this matrix. So the alpha guys are essentially the don't care terms. Um, and so the typical rank one extension that we have is when everything in sight is one, which would work, but this is the more general one. Um, so this is essentially all rank one extensions have this form. Um, and so this is what it looks like. And so the null space, if you will, is two-dimensional. And so here's a basis for the null space. It's these two vectors. So for example, if you multiply this vector against this row vector, you're going to get 1 minus 1. And likewise here, you're going to get alpha E2 over alpha E1 minus alpha E2 over alpha E1. So this is a basis for the null space. And this essentially tells you you can send two messages. You can multiply this one with the first message. So you put A here, and this would be alpha times A, and you put B here. And that's what you would send. So basically, you can vary A and B. You get two messages, um, and you can decode both. Okay, so that's, uh, and in fact, you, you immediately see that the edge variable ends up being just alpha E1 times A plus alpha E2 times B when you add these two things. Okay, um, so that should be simple enough. And so. Again, the details weren't important. I mean, the, the point is that you can take, you know, if you want to maximize the sum rate using linear scalar network coding, it's matrix, it's low rank matrix completion you need to solve. Um, that was the scalar case. Extending this to the vector linear case is straightforward. You just repeat, you know, um, the sources and the destinations and the edge variables. You block them up. <coughs> Nothing really different. One can have various generalizations. If you want to, say, maximize the minimum rate, then it turns out that you construct this matrix and you need to minimize the maximum rank of certain sub-matrices of A. Um, I won't talk about that too much. But there are also all other types of problems that you can cast as low rank matrix completion. Again, provided things are linear. So linear index coding, distributed storage, again, if you're doing things linearly, Matroid realizability can be set up as more, I would say, this problem here than the direct um, low rank matrix completion. Um, and then also, you know, there's certain things called rank codes and under erasures. If you want to decode rank codes, again, it's the same problem. Okay? So this problem does come up a lot, right? Um, 
But people usually, you know, when they look at linear index coding or any of these things, they usually don't view it through this lens, even though that's what you do or need to solve. And I think it's primarily because we don't really have a handle on how to do this. There's no efficient algorithms um, to address this problem. Okay? So, um, what I would like to do in this talk is really to take some motivation from, as I said, a lot of work that's been done um, in low ranks matrix completion over the reals and apply it to this setting. But before I do that, let me just formalize what it is what we want to do. So let A be some M by N matrix over some finite field. Let S denotes some subset of its entries. And so the problem we want to solve is we want to minimize the rank of A given, you know, values of A on that particular subset. So A of S is observed. It's some quantity of Y. So A of S essentially means the entries of A on the subset S. <coughs> okay? Now network coding, at least the problem I described, is a special case of this because the revealed entries were either 0 or 1. And furthermore, we only had a single one in each row. Okay, so it's not fully general, but that's what it is. Um, now, I'm under no illusion that this problem is, you know, easy or whatever. I mean, it's a hard problem. In fact, there's a, a paper from a while back by uh, Spielman showing it's NP-hard in, in full generality. So I'm not going to claim we're going to be able to solve this. But what we are looking for are practical algorithms <coughs> with provable guarantees, okay? So under certain conditions, I want to be able to say that the algorithms that we're proposing work. <coughs> and my focus today will be on GF2, so the matrices will be binary. Okay, so as I said, I want to take some motivation from what people have done over reals, okay? So the problem there is, even though formally it looks the same, the fact that the field is, is real numbers is, is, uh, makes things very different. Um, and so people have been interested in this problem. Again, it's the same thing. You have a M by N matrix over the reals. You want to minimize the rank subject to observing some of the entries. And I would say in the last decade, this has attracted a great deal of attention. You might have heard of the Netflix problem. Um, which essentially was related to this. It comes up in machine learning a lot. It even comes up in some wireless communication problems. Um, <clears throat> there's a related problem which is called low rank matrix recovery, where you replace observing entries by observing, say, linear combinations of entries. So some linear operator applied to A. Um, okay, so this is a bit more general because you can view you know, the uh, matrix completion problem is a special case where L is just observing certain entries. It's again a linear operator. <coughs> okay, now this again is a hard problem. It's non-convex because of the rank. The objective is non-convex. The constraint is linear. Um, and so a popular relaxation is to replace the rank with what's called the nuclear norm of the matrix, which is the sum of its singular values. Okay, so this was, I guess, first proposed by Mariam Fazel in her 1998 PhD thesis. Um, and so people have been using it. And so this is the surrogate you, pro you solve. This is the convex problem. You solve instead of the rank. It's very well studied. Um, so we have a, an almost complete theory of, of what goes on, and I'll kind of give you a little bit of a sense of what that theory is without going through any proof, okay? So it turns out that, so you're solving a problem which is not the problem you want to solve, okay? But under certain conditions, solving this will give you the solution you desire, right? And so what is that condition, right? So let's suppose the true A I was looking for, who's, you know, I'm only observing linear combinations of its entries, is, is A, and let's assume that's the SVD, use sigma V transpose, and let's assume this matrix is rank R. Okay? Then it turns out that you can give an if and only if condition for which, you know, under what condition this optimization returns you the true A. And the if and only if condition is the following thing. It says, you look at this linear operator L, you look at every W in its null space. So you look at all W's 
for which LW is zero, and you require the following inequality to hold. So you take W, you project it onto U and V, and take the trace, and then you take the same W, now you project it onto the orthogonal complements, if you will, of U and V, so these are the perps, and you take the nuclear norm of that, and if this summation is, non, is positive for every W in the null space of L, you're done. Okay? So, <coughs> that's the condition. In fact, it's just, it's a simple condition to derive. It's just, a, this is a convex program. This is the first order condition for optimality. So if you want A to be the solution to this, this is what comes out from the first order condition. Um, the problem is checking this is very difficult. If I give you a particular A, and I say, check this, it's really hard. So, because you have to check it for every W in the null space of L, and I don't know how to do that. I don't know anybody who knows how to do that. Um, and so what people do instead is they view the problem probabilistically. So for example, it turns out if this matrix L, not, well, this operator L, which is taking linear combinations of the matrix A, if the coefficients, so the way you take linear combinations, you multiply A with these coefficients, if the coefficients are chosen IID from a normal 0, 1 distribution, so 0 mean unit variance, then you can say, even though you can't argue for any particular operator L, you can say with high probability over the choice of this operator L, which is chosen randomly now, this condition will hold, provided the number of measurements is at least 3 times m plus n times r. Okay, so that's the type of result. So with high probability, if you see at least this many measurements, this works. And this is actually an important number. <coughs> so if you have a m by n matrix, so let's say this is m, and this is n, okay? Um, and let's suppose this matrix is rank R. Okay. So let's see how many degrees of freedom such. So, uh, you know, if there was no rank R constraint, there's MN entries in this matrix, so there's MN degrees of freedom. Once I restrict the rank, that reduces the degrees of freedom. So in particular, what it means is that I should have some submatrix here, R by R, that's full rank. And so let's assume that's this guy here. Okay, and so I can kind of partition this matrix this way. So let's assume that's full rank. So if this is full rank, then you know this matrix here is determined by the rest of them if you're rank R. Because um, if this guy is rank R and that's full rank, it means the sure complement of this, which is this times this matrix times the inverse of that times this should be zero. Okay, so this is determined now. There's no freedom in what this block down here is, if you give me the rest, okay? And so, you know, you have R squared, I guess. So let's look at how many entries you have in this top matrix. If you do the calculation, it's this. Because you have, I guess, MR here, NR here, and I've counted this region twice, so I have to subtract out the R squared. Okay? So the result is actually saying something significant. So when R is small, the degrees of freedom is roughly M plus N times R. And so what this is saying is that if, I, if you just give me three times as many as the degrees of freedom, random linear combinations of A, that's enough for me be, to be able to efficiently recover A. Okay? So I need an oversampling of three, okay? and that's a guarantee. And in fact, this is a phase transition. If you give me anything less than this, it won't work. Okay. Um, now, <coughs> so that's what I just said. Now, for the matrix completion problem, which is where I'm not doing arbitrary Gaussian linear combinations of the entries, rather I'm revealing some of the entries for you. There people have studied if I randomly reveal them. And again, there's some conditions on incoherence where I won't go into. And so the theory here is not as tight as it is there, and so the types of results that people have is that the size of S, so the number of entries that you see, has to be the order of log N to some power that I don't know. Okay. 
And so people really work hard to reduce this. You know. um, and I think people speculate that the log n may not even be necessary. It, uh, empirically, it looks like that it's the same three that you need, but what people can prove here is this. Okay? So you need a little bit more, again, than the, num the degrees of freedom. Okay? But those are the types of results. So this is significant because you're solving a convex problem, but under certain conditions, you can guarantee that you found the, the true solution. Okay? So we want to do something similar like that for finite field matrix completion. <coughs> now, if you attempt to do this, the first thing that becomes hard is, you know, how do you relax finite field things, right? So, you know, if, if you have an integer program, you know, relaxing it to something convex is easy. So, for example, if you have an integer program where all the variables are, say, 0 and 1, you know, you can relax that to the integer, to the interval 0, 1, right? But finite field is different, right? Because if you have, you know, in finite field, you have something like this, say, in GF2, right? Um, and so that's a problem, right? If, you, if all you do is this, you know, this doesn't hold anymore. So you have to be a little bit more sophisticated in terms of how you do the relaxation, okay? And so fortunately, there's at least one example. That's Feldman's LP decoder, which does this, and so we're going to draw some inspiration from that. And so let me describe uh, what Feldman did. <coughs> so it's called LP decoding, linear programming decoding. So let's suppose we have some LDPC code, some low density parity check code of rate m over n. So that means that the dimension of the code, the number of um, information bits is m, and the length of the code is n. Okay? And so we'll describe this LDPC through its parity check matrix P which, you know, I kind of like to multiply things on the right, so the parity check will be n minus m by n. So there's n minus m linear equations that this code should satisfy. Okay? Now, say if I, you know, um, observe a noise corrupted version of, say, some code word that you transmit, say y, so y is a code word where some of the Entries have been flipped, zeros have been turned into one, ones to zeros. The maximum likelihood decoder essentially says that, you know, look for code words that in a Hamming distance are as close to Y as possible. Right? And being a code word essentially means that C is in the null space of P. That's what the parity check matrix does. Okay? So that's, you know, that's a finite field optimization problem. Again, in general, NP hard. And so in LP decoding, what do you do? So we want to relax this to something that's convex, right? So C lives in GF2, okay? So we'll relax each component of this vector to lie between 0 and 1. That's what we've done here. And, you know, it's customary, and people kind of know this, that, you know, if you have something like the Hamming distance, which is counting the number of non-zero entries in the vector y minus C, the best, so that should be relaxed, not relaxed. Um, the best relaxation is, the best convex relaxation is an L1 norm, so the sum of the absolute values. Okay? So that's easy to do. The question really is, what do we do with the linear constraints? Okay, that's the tricky thing, because, you know, so if I have a constraint that is just, say, C1 plus C2 equal to zero, meaning that the first and second entries of the code word should have even parity. You know, I can't just relax this over the reals to this equation, right? Because I want 1 plus 1 to also be a solution of this, which it isn't if I just relax to 0. So what Feldman proposed was the following thing, and so I'll introduce a little bit of notation. So, um, as I said, we have n minus m parity check equations. Let's look at the ith equation. And so the ith equation, you're looking at the ith row of the matrix P. And so let's assume that in that ith equation, the variables that show up are in this set SI, I for the ith equation. And so that means the ith equation really is the following thing. So the sum of the entries of C, where J is in this set SI, is 0. Okay, so that's, so that's an equation. And so this is what I want to relax. And so the way to think of it is um, so, so there is, you know, um, the size of SI variables in this equation. 
So there's two to the s possible values you can put in. Half of them will satisfy this. And so there are two to the size of si minus one solutions to this equation. Okay? And so what he proposes to do is view those solutions as zero, one vectors and relax to the convex hull. Okay, so for example, if I have, say, some equation like this, there's four solutions. Okay, and so I will replace this equation with the convex hull of these four vectors. That's what he proposes. Um, and it turns out, in this case, the convex, well, the convex cone, in fact, um, it turns out if you do that, the convex cone is easy to describe. It's just, um, again, size of SI inequalities, where what essentially you say that every variable that shows up in SI has to be less than or equal to the sum of the rest. Okay, so you replace um, one finite field equality with whatever number of inequalities. Okay? Um, so that's how he does the relaxation. And so you'll get a whole bunch of inequalities for each of the parity tech equations. You when you consider them all together, you'll get this big set of inequalities. They describe a cone, that's called the fundamental cone of P. I'll use the notation fun P for that. And so this is what the LP decoder is. So you minimize the L1 norm of Y minus C. Now everything is real. Y is viewed, even though these are zero, one vectors, they're viewed as being real. And the minimization is over C being between zero and one and these linear inequalities, okay? So that's the relaxation, but what's really cool about it is that this comes with provable guarantees, okay? Um, so it's not just any old relaxation or heuristic that you come up with. You can actually say something about when it works. I don't want to go through the details, but it turns out that you can prove if the number of errors in Y, so Y was a code word where you flipped some of the bits. So if the number of bits you flip is below a certain threshold, and the threshold depends on expansion properties of the bipartite graph corresponding to P, which I won't go into, um, then the LP decoder recovers the true C. Okay, so it has a guarantee. Okay, so it's not just a relaxation, it has a guarantee. And in fact, later on people realize that you know, popular methods such as message passing and some product can be viewed as approximations to this LP. So this works better than, say, message passing. Okay, so I want to draw inspiration from this. So can we do something similar for matrix completion? How much time do I have? Some? Okay, I can, I can do something. <laughs> Okay, so let me kind of describe what it is we want to do. <coughs> so for simplicity, I'm going to look at the square case. We can do n1 and n2, but I'll do the square case so I don't have too much notation. Um, so I'm switching from A to X here, if you don't mind. So there's going to be some true low rank matrix X star that we're trying to recover. Okay, now the first thing I want to talk about is because we're going to do some probabilistic analysis, is how many n by n rank R matrices are there? Um, so let's assume I have this n by n matrix and it's rank R. So let's first count and see how many we have. So if this is rank R, it means that you know it should be the outer product of two full rank. So this will be R. This will be n, and this will be full rank. And likewise, this is n, this is r, and this is also full rank. It should have a factorization like this. And so let's count how many of these guys we have. So if you look at the first column, there's 2 to the n minus 1 ways I can fill out the first column. I just can't put 0 is the only thing I can't put there. And then if I now look at the second column, I can put anything there that's not a multiple of the first one. Okay, and there, I can either multiply with a zero or one, so there's two of them. 
And then that goes on. If I look at the third one, I can put anything here that's not a linear combination of these two, but there's four linear combinations of those, and so you get, I guess, this, because there's R columns. And then you do the same thing for this, only you do it on the rows, and so that just repeats. And so these things square. And so is that the answer? Yeah, yeah, I, I overcounted. So I can throw any invertible thing here. So I have to divide by the number of invertible guys there, which is 2 to the r minus 1, because they're r by r. Um, so that's how many there are. And that's what I've written there. Um, Okay, so capital N of N R is the number of N by N matrices of rank R. That's how many there is. And so the reason why I'm bringing this up is, so we're doing matrix completion. So every time, so, you know, if, if I wanted to tell you which rank R matrix X star is, I need log 2 N N R bits to specify that, right? That's how many bits I will need to tell you, because this is how many there are. Okay. Now, when I'm doing matrix completion, every time I reveal an entry, an entry is 0, 1, I'm giving you a bit of information. Right? So the number of you know, measurements I need, or the entries, or the number of revealed entries, should be at least you know, log base 2 of that number. Because I need at least that many bits. And so this kind of is the counterpart of the degrees of freedom that we had. So if I can guarantee recovery, say, if you reveal entries that are, say, some factor of this, I would like that, right? This is the benchmark I need to compare against, okay? And, um, you know, when r is a lot less than n, if you do this calculation, it turns out that this is nothing but 2nr. Um, so it kind of jives with the degrees of freedom um, in, the, um, in the real case, when r is very small. Okay, so that's what I said. We need at least log 2 nnr entries. So we're going to do a probabilistic analysis, just like we did, or I showed you in the, in the real case. I won't be able to give you any guarantee on a particular matrix. It's going to be probabilistic. So the way we're going to do things is I'm going to randomly and uniformly choose a rank R matrix from the set of this many. And I'm going to randomly and uniformly reveal a subset of the entries. Okay? So those are the two ran so there's two sources of randomness. One is X star, one is the entries I'm revealing. <coughs> Okay, I don't think I need the second definition, so I'll skip that. And so here's the basic strategy. And so this is really the, well, I'll get to it in a second, okay? So let's suppose that I could somehow find two collections of sets, H1 and H2. So these are collections of sets. So the elements are subsets of 1 to n, right? With the following property. So H1 is going to describe to me null space vectors, row vectors of x star. So if S1 is an element in this set, if I look at the row vector that has ones where S has entries, so for example, if the set is 1, 2, 3, this has ones on the first three entries. Okay, so it's a way of representing a null space vector. Okay, and S2 is the same for the columns. Okay, so let's suppose I have these collections H1 of H2 of null space vectors, and I'm parametrizing them by the support of, the, of these vectors, and those supports I'm viewing as sets, subsets of 1 to n. Okay. Um, so we're, we're going to try to find such collections, but once you have these collections, then I'll describe the meta-algorithm as the following thing. So suppose we've constructed H1 or H2, or somebody has given it to us, then what we do, so we have these vectors in the null space of x star. And so what we can do is we can construct, you know, we have a whole bunch of them. They have a linear span. 
And so I will look at the orthogonal complement of the span of these guys. Okay. Since the ESIs were all vectors from the null space, this U1 will essentially be a superspace of the range space of x on this side and a superspace of the range space of x on the other side. Essentially meaning that the x I'm looking for um, should have this characteristic. Now, if, I, if I'm able to identify some of the null space, the reason why that's useful is I can you know, get a superspace of the range space. So the range space should be n by r, because it's a rank r thing. But if I can do it for some k that's bigger than r, so if I have some idea of where the true range space is in, then, and I do the same thing both for the rows and the columns, then my unknowns essentially become, rather than a full n by n matrix, now a k1 by k2 matrix. Because th these, these u1 and u2 I know. And so I can just insist that you know, this new matrix, when I, when I observe the entries S, has to match what I see. These are linear equations. And so if I have enough of them, and if things are full rank, I can recover X tilde. There's, there's only K1, K2 unknowns here. And if I've recovered X tilde, then I've recovered X. Okay, because I just go and I multiply with U1 and U2. Okay, so if this equation has a unique solution for X tilde, I'm done. So that's what the strategy will be. We will try to estimate null space vectors on X star, because as soon as I, the more I can construct null space vectors, the more I can confine the range space. Okay? And that reduces the number of unknowns I need to search for. And at some point, I might have enough unknowns that, you know, this system of equation becomes consistent and I'm done. So that's the strategy. Of course, devil is in the detail, and the critical step is somebody has to give me these H1, H2. Okay, so how are we going to do that? We're going to do it by looking at null space vectors of increasing weight. Okay, so H1 <coughs> was a set of null space vector rows that are on the left null space. H1, 2 will be pairs of rows whose sum is zero on common revealed entries. So what do I mean by that? So let's suppose I have a particular um, row in the matrix somewhere that's this, and somewhere else I have another row that matches perfectly this row on the revealed entries. So I don't know about the x's, but wherever they're revealed, okay? So I will postulate that these two rows have to be the same. And um, you might say, well, that's ridiculous. There's all these entries you don't see. How can you guess that these are the same? The argument is that, you know, if I choose two random row vectors, I choose them independently at random, and I reveal some of the entries, if on those revealed entries they match, chances are they were the same. Okay, so I'm going to rely on that and the fact that I've revealed enough entries for that to be true. So that's H12. H13 is the same thing, only we look at triples, where if you look at the revealed entries or the common revealed entries, so again, this could have something here. I only care about the common ones. If they sum up to zero, then essentially I have a null space vector, or I'm postulating I have a null space vector of weight three, because the sum of those three on the revealed entries were zero. And so on. You can do this for four and so on. And you can do the same thing for the columns. So that's the strategy we're going to use. Of course, there's some questions. So first of all, we have to make sure that such pairs and triples exist. How do I know that there are going to be null space vectors of weight two or three? I need to guarantee that. And second of all, what is the chance that if they do agree, say in this case, on their revealed entries that they are actually the same. Okay, so those are the two random events that I need to get a handle on. It'll depend on how many revealed entries there are. Okay, so that's the strategy. What I need to convince you is that, you know, does this work? I mean, how far do we have to go in terms of the weight of the null space vectors, okay? So if X star has rank R, it turns out that you can always find a basis for the null space 
where every vector has weight at most r plus 1. Yes, five minutes? OK, <laughs> we'll try. Um, is this obvious, or does this? It should be obvious, right? Because if you go to standard basis, so if you have you know, a null space, so if the rank is r, the null space will have dimension n minus r. So this will be n, this will be n minus r. I can always choose a basis where I have an identity here and some left over there. Right? And this is of size r. And so there's only one one in the identity. There's at most r over here, and so that's it. So if the rank is low, you will find low weight um, null space vectors. Now if the rank is really low, so if n is bigger than r times 2 to the r, with high probability, there is a basis for the null space where every vector has weight at most 3. Can anyone see why? Well, it turns out that if, if you have this many, if n is that big, it turns out that, so if you look at a rank r matrix, again, as I have here, okay, it factors this way. And so if n is bigger than r to the 2r, it turns out that with high probability, you will see all possible r-dimensional vectors there, okay? And r-dimensional vectors, they're a group. The sum of any two is another one. And so those are weight 3 and all space vectors. So if the, if the rank is very low, you can only do weight 3. And you can play all types of games. So if n is like bigger than 2 to the r over t, there's at least one vector in the null space with weight 2. If this is the case, there's at least one with weight 3. You can play all kinds of games. The bottom line is that if the matrix is low rank, low weight null space vectors exist. And that's the critical observation. Again, if, if you think of coding, if the matrix is low rank, the null space is almost full rank. So it's, a, it's like a code, a random code with very high rate. Very high rate random codes have low weight code words. So that's, that's, that's really the intuition. And um, so based on that, we can prove for this meta-algorithm, um, the following theorem. Again, I'm not very proud of this because things are very loose, but it has guarantees, right? So if you give me some rank R matrix, and if you reveal some fraction of the entries, so this is a vanishing a fraction of the entries, randomly, then this algorithm where you go all the way up to weight R um, null space vectors works with high probability, and this is the complexity. Um, if n is very big, so if r is kind of logarithmic in n, then you only need to go up to h13, so you only need to look for um, weight 3 uh, null space vectors, and with high probability you recover things with complexity n to the 7, and you only need to see n to the 5 third of the entries. Okay, so these are guarantees. I'm not proud about them because the bounds are very loose and they're very pessimistic, but I'm giving you guarantees. Um, so if I have two minutes, I want to talk about a much more a better and practical performing algorithm. So the reason why these things were loose and didn't really work very, very well is kind of in the proofs we have to assume that we never make an error when we you know, identify a vector in the null space. We're inferring it from entries that are seen. We might make errors. And so we're trying to rule that out, and so things become pessimistic. But if you allow to make errors, you can allow for a way to fix them. So the point is we don't need, as I said, the entire null space. We just need enough so that this equation has a unique solution. And so we have to balance between being aggressive in finding subsets, because if you're too aggressive in finding these subsets, you might get inconsistencies if you make an error. And if you're not too aggressive, you may not be able to build enough of the null space vectors. Okay, and so I'm short on time, otherwise I would have said, can I go over time, two minutes, or you're the boss? Two minutes, two minutes. okay. So, so the idea basically is this. Um, <coughs> 
So once you have your candidates for H1 and H2, um, again, some of them might have been chosen in error because even though these guys say match where they are, maybe in fact there was a difference somewhere down here that we didn't see. So we should um, take that into account. And the way I'm going to take that into account is for any subset in this set, I'm going to associate a binary variable. Zero meaning that alpha 1 should not be here, 1 meaning that it should. Okay. And I'll do the same thing for the null spaces that are column vectors, uh, or the null space vectors that are column vectors. Um, and so what I want to do is to maximize the number of consistent parity checks, or null space vectors. And um, again, the objective doesn't matter. We're only going up to three, which means that I'm only looking at things up to weight three. And so I'm looking for x. So x has to match the observations whenever ij is in the set. If it's not in the set, then it's some binary variable I don't know. The y's and the z's are, again, binary. And if a y is one, it means that that linear combination of the columns is zero mod 2, and if z is 1, it means that linear combination of the rows mod 0 is, um, mod 2 is 0, okay? So this is combinatorial because these are 0, 1s, and these are, you know, GF2 equations. And so the natural way to relax them is to take the 0, 1 and put them between 0 and 1, so that should be a comma. And all the GF2 equations, we relax a la Feldman. So we look, we construct the convex cone of all the solutions. And that's an LP. And I'll just show you the results and I'll wind up. Okay, so this works very well. Um, so this is a simulation done for n equal to 100. So these are 100 by 100 matrices. And I'm running the rank from 3 to 10. Okay. And so what I have here, kappa, is the ratio between the number of revealed entries and the minimum, which is the log base 2 of the number of such rank R n by n matrices. White means success, black means failure. And so I think if we'd run more simulations, the, the gray would have tightened up. But the bottom line is that you kind of succeed when you oversample by 3, which is what we know is the case in, for reals. Um, so is this for random matrices? This is for random matrices, yes. So I can't say anything about the matrices that show up in network coding. Um, but by the same token, in the, in, for the reals, if I give you a fixed matrix completion. You can. And so here's just another experiment to show the same thing. So here I fixed the rank at 5, and I'm running n from 25 to 100. And, you know, we're still below 3. Um, so this works very well. It works much better than we had expected. Um, I mean, this is as good as anything you can get for reals. Um, so let me kind of conclude. So as I try to argue linear network coding, index coding, as long as you have the linear word in front of them, you can reduce to low ranks matrix completion over some finite field. Again, no illusions. Problem is NP hard. And so what we're looking for are efficient algorithms with provable guarantees. And the provable is really in a probabilistic setting. And the, the, the flavor we want is, is of the type I described. If you reveal at random this many entries, then with high probability this algorithm will succeed. That's the type of result we want. And again, we've been motivated by convex relaxation methods particular matrix completion over reals and Feldman's LP decoding. I described a meta-algorithm, which is not really practical, even though it's polynomial time and whatever, but I would never use it. Um, and the bounds are loose, and as I said, it's not practical. I did describe briefly a practical linear program, which is quite efficient, performs very well. We don't have any proof of performance. And I put yet there because we haven't really looked at it closely. This is very recent results. So I'm sure we can get some kinds of bounds on the performance. Whether we can make them tight, I don't know. And finally, you know, I don't know anything about extensions beyond binary right now. Um, so I'll stop here.